Um, before we actually start off with the first session, we're going to have a quick um, welcome message uh, from the chair of the, the Sillip Rare Books and Special Collections Group. That is Sarah Merherter, who is the manager of the University Archives and Special Collections Centre at the University of the Arts in London. Uh, so I'm going to pass over to Sarah for a, a few quick opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, Bob. And welcome everyone um, to our first online Rare Books and Special Collections Group Annual Study Conference. It's also the most international conference that we have run so far because people are joining us from all over the world. I can see on the attendees list that we have colleagues with us from all around the UK as well as Auckland, uh, Melbourne, Manila, Copenhagen, Serbia and Warsaw, just to name a few that I noticed as I was looking through the list this morning. You're all very welcome and we're, we're delighted that you can join us for these two days of the Appliance of Science. So um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors who have kindly supported us in um, our uh, attempts to get a, an online conference up and running this year. Um, so Adam Matthews Digital, Adam Matthew Digital, Bernard Quaritch Limited, the Institute of English Studies and John Dice Antiquarian Booksellers have all kindly supported us um, in this venture. And uh, I'm sure we are all um, embracing technology. We have all been embracing technology over the last year and a bit. Um, and uh, we're very, very grateful for their support. Um, talking of technology, we're using a, an online platform supplied by Hoover to, um, to make this conference happen um, alongside uh, Zoom um, for the actual talks. So um, I expect most of you have found the, um, the Hoover site. You've all been given links to it. And you'll see on there some, um, some really great features, not quite as great as standing in a sunny garden in the evening with a, with a glass of wine, but maybe we'll do that again some other time. <laughs> but um, you can see the, the menu on the side of the Hoover site gives you all of the, um, the agenda, um, the, uh, the sessions, um, the speakers' profiles. And then you can see who's attending. There's a list with all, all of our um, job titles and profiles that we supplied when we registered. There's also um, a community board where you can um, interact with, with colleagues who are on this conference. Um, messages, um, you can share information, um, recommend book titles or, or reading um, and, uh, and share your information and expertise. I can see someone's put up some photos already um, and there's also a link to our sponsors so if you want to follow up with any of the, the four that I've just mentioned um, their profiles and links are available. So um, just a, a quick run through of, of what's there um, but today we are looking at um, the appliance of science to our, to our work, to our world um, how, uh, what might developments in science and technology mean for special collections? Well, I'm sure we've all been grappling with that, as I've said, over the last couple of years, and we will continue to. And I think, you know, we, we will all know that we've learned so much um, about how to um, apply science to our, um, and technology to our day-to-day -day lives. But I think what we will hear over the next couple of days goes a lot deeper than that and picks up on um, a number of um, really interesting and um, pertinent research projects looking at what science can tell us about our collections and how we can apply that um, and make use of that in the way that we care for our collections and in the services that we provide to our users. So, um, you know, we're going to hear about decolonizing the collections and how um, collections can um, address our social justice agenda we can look at uncovering provenance, um, who's really made these pieces, where have they really been? Um, how can we see and use our collections differently now? Um, so, you know, how can we really make use of, um, of technology to explore our collections in new ways, um, maybe using AI, using um, other forms of technology? 
how can we progress our cataloging to make our collections um, discoverable and easily found by our users? Now, many of these questions may seem familiar, but I think what we will see over the next couple of days is how um, technology can help us to answer those questions in new ways and find innovative opportunities to apply all of that to our day-to-day -day life and to answer some really important questions about our collections. So on that point, I think I shall, I shall stop speaking and I shall hand back to Bob and I shall wish you all a very happy and informative conference. I shall see you along the way and at the closing comments at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Sarah. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, hopefully a lot of interesting things that we're going to uh, unpick there that you've, you've started to raise uh, um, in your, your introduction there. Um, our morning session uh, is, uh, offers to be very interesting. Um, this is the, the first session of the day is, gonna, is starting, well, started already at 10 and is going to be running to just after 12 o'clock. We're going to have two presentations. Uh, now that's four speakers in total, so there'll be two joint presentations. Um, and there'll be opportunities for you to ask your questions at the end of each of those uh, presentations. So it's going to be kind of around about 15 minutes or so for questions after each of those. Um, in terms of, so it's just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce the first. In terms of actually, uh, at, um, in terms of asking questions, I would ask you to, within Zoom, either use the raise hand function uh, and um, uh, Christine will, will identify you and we can ask you to, to, to verbalise your question to speak. Or you, if you prefer, you can put your question in the chat and we can read it out to the speakers. Uh, that is the Zoom chat. There is, in fact, within Hoover, a chat function. So uh, on the opening, uh, on, on the, the link that you connected uh, through to the Zoom chat, uh, the Zoom, this Zoom with, there is a, a Hoover chat function. We'd ask you to avoid using that because we're going to try and keep the chat within Zoom. So we're recording it all. OK. Um, Everything is being recorded here and you'll be able to see it later on uh, if you have to pop out and you're missing anything. Um, I think that's that's probably us actually in terms of housekeeping. So I can probably start to introduce our first talk of the day. Um, we have two speakers um, uh, with this first presentation of the day. Um, the first is Dr. Paola Ricciardi who works as a senior research scientist at the Fitzwilliam Museum, a department of the University of Cambridge. She has a background in physics uh, and worked as a heritage scientist in Italy, France, and the United States before moving to Cambridge in 2011. Paola's main research interests include the cross-disciplinary study of artists' materials and techniques, the transfer of knowledge between artists and craftsmen working in different media, and the development of innovative resources for STEAM outreach, that's science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. Uh, and that's particularly aimed at school children and their teachers. And our second speaker for this presentation is Dr. Laura Angelova, Head of Conservation Research and Audience Development at the National Archives here in the UK, where she previously worked as a conservation scientist. Laura's background is, is in chemistry and surface cleaning of cultural and heritage materials. Uh, and a current focus lies in the intersection of heritage science, conservation research, and archival practice. Uh, and their presentation is going to be called, What Can Heritage Science Do For You? A jargon busting session. So without further ado, I shall hand over. Thank you, Bob. Let's see if I can um, share my screen now. Mm, let's see. Here we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, scream if not, please. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm gonna get us started. Um, Laura and I are really glad to be here and um, be starting the, the session this morning and starting the conference off. Um, and we're most thankful to Bob for inviting us to be here. Um, we're gonna, Bob and, Bob and and us um, got in touch a couple of years ago, I think, when he came to a session that Laura and I were doing um, 
on pretty much the same topic, except that was a full day session. And obviously we've only got about 45 minutes this morning. So we're gonna do our best. Um, but what we really want to do, I think, is try and introduce um, heritage science a little bit for those of you who might not be too familiar with it. Um, and most of all, really try and encourage you to ask lots of questions. We won't be providing a whole lot of answers, but we're gonna try and um, encourage you to ask questions um, to the people that you're gonna have to work with if you want heritage science to be um, part of your, um, of your work. Um, so I guess to get us started, we thought it might be helpful um, to give a definition of heritage science. There are lots of them around. Um, the key point here, I think, is that heritage science is cross-disciplinary by nature, um, if only because it involves lots of different sciences, you know, physical heart sciences, including physics and chemistry, but um, also engineering, biology, and increasingly AI, um, and virtual reality, all kinds of artificial intelligence and, you know, text recognition and image recognition. So it's really the application of all these kinds of scientific and technological methods to the study of heritage science sites and collections. Um, and it, it, as it is so cross-disciplinary, heritage science um, really is by default um, a, a collective, a collaborative endeavor, um, which usually on, on a, in, a, in a normal or in a regular sort of, um, in the course of a regular project will probably involve one or more scientists and potentially conservators as well, as, well as um, librarians or their um, collection specialists, curators, historians, art historians, manuscript scholars, book scholars, book historians, um, all sorts of disciplines really um, are involved in order to make heritage science um, worth it. Um, in terms of what heritage science can do for the study of um, books and manuscripts and special collections, <clears throat> um, I think what, what is really important and what we like to stress is that um, in order for it to be relevant to you, the people who are in charge of the collections, um, it really needs to answer questions. It, need, it, need to be, it needs to be applied in order to answer questions that you are interested in. Um, as I said, a lot of this is about asking the right questions, not necessarily providing um, answers. And broadly speaking, if we're looking at um, collections and special collections, um, there are various types of questions that you might um, be interested in, in asking to which heritage science can help, which heritage science can help answer, if not provide a straightforward answer necessarily. And these are about um, authorship. Um, and that could be straight up authorship as in, in identification of an individual who, um, wrote or decorated a book or a manuscript, or it could simply be for um, an illuminated manuscript, perhaps, um, who's got the contribution of different hands, the identification of the number of different hands at work. You can look at composition and technology. Um, and again, for books and manuscripts, we're looking at all the materials that compose an object like this, from inks to paper or a parchment and pigments and binding materials, for example. Um, and through the composition, the technology, you can start answering questions about history and provenance as well. You know, book is not obviously, the, the materiality of a book doesn't only comprise um, its original materiality, but also potential modifications that have occurred through time, uh, whether because of um, sort of um, specific changes that have been made or because of conservation treatments, for example, or because of damages that someone has tried to repair, for example. And so again, th there could be questions about conservation needs and concerns today, for example, degradation of materials that needs to be addressed and heritage sites can help you identify those and figure out a way to find good, um, appropriate conservation treatments, for example, and of course, authentication, which I guess is the, um, is, is the one thing that most people, when, when they talk to a heritage science, a scientist, if I, if I say that's what I do, people ask, oh, so you, you detect fakes. And I'm like, well, no, most of the time I don't actually. But um, I guess in, in, in popular culture, that's what we do quite a lot of. Um, and the other thing that's quite important to us in terms of, I guess, again, relevance of what we do is to say that obviously you can focus research on a single object, but you can also start, um, if we're looking at a, 
large enough, large enough number of objects, you can start asking and answering much broader cultural or contextual questions. And um, we'll hear several examples of this, actually, I know, during the course of this conference. Um, so to start um, going down a little bit more in, into the practical, so, you know, yes, fine, this is where heritage science can do, but how do we do it? Um, Laura and I thought we'd, we'd provide a little bit of an outline of various types of um, techniques that can be used and are used on a regular basis um, to analyze books and manuscripts and library collections. We will not, we're not aiming to be comprehensive. There's just no way that we could do it um, in, in 45 minutes. Um, but we will try and give some highlights of the techniques that are most commonly used. Um, and the first thing we should say is that the, uh, analytical methods can be invasive or non-invasive, which means they can, non-invasive means they don't damage the object, they don't even, they don't require a sample from the object, um, they don't even touch the object potentially, whereas an invasive method will have some sort of interaction with the object itself. A method could be destructive or non-destructive, um, and this terminology actually was in use until quite recently to distinguish between invasive and non-invasive, but now we're we're separating the two. Non-invasive means I'm not, um, it's non-invasive towards the object. Non-destructive means it's not destructive towards a sample that I might have taken from an object. So a method could require sampling, but then be non-destructive in the sense that the sample remains intact and can perhaps be reused for further analysis or be stored. Um, or it could be destructive. A method could actually destroy the sample that it's working on. And then methods can be site specific, which means they're point measurements. You're taking a measurement on a relatively small area of an object, or you can use them in an imaging or scanning modality, which means we're getting information about a large portion or even a whole object or a whole image, for example, a whole page within um, a book. And all of these different types of analysis can provide different types of data, which can be physical data, so color, for example, the parameters that one can observe, um, elemental data, so identification of the chemical elements present, um, lead or tin or mercury or iron or manganese, or data about um, the molecule, the molecular structure, so compounds, chemical compounds that we can identify. So for example, I can identify um, the amount of water within um, the parchment that I'm looking at, or the amount of a specific protein in the, in the consolidant that I'm looking at. To um, begin with, um, and in fact, the focus for most of this um, presentation is on non-invasive and non-destructive methods, because obviously, for obvious reasons, those are preferable um, for use on, on materials that you don't necessarily need, um, want to, to remove uh, a physical sample from. Um, and to start with, um, we'll be going through some site-specific measurements. So measurements, types of techniques, that give you some information about a relatively small area within your object. And there are obviously um, lots of these. Um, the ones we're briefly going to mention this morning um, are listed here, there's only five. Um, there are quite a few more, but these are the ones that are most commonly used in, in, um, in labs, both here in the UK and elsewhere in the world. The first method we thought we'd mention is probably the one that is most commonly used and has been used for a really long time, and that is X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy. Um, and you see a picture here of an XRF um, spectrometer in use, a portable one, a handheld spectrometer in use on a book, um, on, a, on a medieval manuscript. And what XRF does is provide, it's one of those methods that provides elemental information. So information about the individual chemical elements present in the area we're analyzing. And what we can do with that information is then infer the presence of specific compounds, in this case, pigments. So what you're seeing here is um, extra spectra of two reddish areas within a manuscript page, one more orangey, one more properly red. Um, and I, as you can see, the spectra are similar in that they both contain lead, but then one of them actually has um, 
a whole lot of other peaks. Those are um, peaks characteristic of Mercury. And Mercury in this case represents um, cinnabar or vermilion, which is a bright red pigment used in manuscript illumination as well as, um, as painting. So what we're seeing here is the fact that the, the, the red pigment is cinnabar or vermilion, whereas the orangey pigment, which does not contain mercury, it only contains lead, is most likely to be red lead or minium. Um, another reddish uh, pigment with an orange hue, which is um, commonly used in manuscript illumination. So what we're doing here is, again, identifying individual chemical elements and then using our knowledge of the chemical composition of specific historical pigments to infer the, um, the composition of these two red um, pigments on the page. As I said, XRF is, is quite commonly used um, for the analysis of um, books and manuscripts and library collections. Um, usually it's used in a couple of different um, modalities. You have instruments which can perform micro XRF, and that really just means that you're looking at a really small area or you can look at really small areas. Um, um, the example here um, that you see at the bottom is, a, is an image from an, uh, an illuminated manuscript and the smallest of the red squares um, identifies the area analyzed with the macro XRF instrument you see on the left. And in fact, you could look at an even smaller area with, with that kind of instrument, you can go to, down to about um, 200 microns. So that's 0 0.2 millimeters in diameter. So you, you can look at tiny, tiny little details. Um, but that system isn't especially portable. I mean, yes, it can be dismantled and transported, but it's about 80 kilos. I don't tend to do it on a daily basis, if I'm honest. Whereas then we have a more portable hand, so-called handheld XRF instruments. We don't usually tend to actually hold them, um, hand hold them next to um, books and manuscripts. We, we use um, photographic tripods to, to keep them still. Um, and those are, again, much more portable. So, you know, you can pick them up and take them pretty much wherever you want, but you, the area you'll be analyzing is quite a bit larger. So in this case, we're looking at about three to four millimeters in diameter, and that's the larger of the two squares on that um, sample illumination. Um, and just to say, you might hear people talk about micro XRF, HH XRF, which stands for handheld, P XRF, conservators especially love to talk about P XRF, um, which just means XRF with a portable instrument, NAXRF for macro XRF, which actually usually refers to XRF scanning, which is a slightly different type of, of modality, which we'll look at later. These are all the same thing. This is all XRF. All these um, prefixes here um, don't actually tell us anything about the type of technique we're using. It's just slightly different modalities. It just means we're looking at a bigger area or a smaller area or an instrument is portable or not portable. Um, so the method we're using is XRF spectroscopy. We're looking at chemical elements. That's it. Um, in terms of quick key questions you might want to ask if someone suggests that they might want to do XRF on one of your collections, or if you're looking for someone to do XRF on, on your collections, is the portability of the instrument, you know, will you need to move the object or, or will they bring it over? The spot size, so the size of the spot they'll be analyzing, because you might need to be looking at details that are so small that a portable instrument might just not cut it. Um, the presence of a helium flush or a vacuum pump, which can both be potentially damaging to the object, but also will allow you to reveal much lighter elements. So some elements, um, you can only really see them in an extra spectrum if you've got a helium flush or a vacuum pump. And also potentially you might wanna ask what the anode is. This is one of the characteristics of the instrument because depending on which chemical element the, atom, the anode is made of, um, you might um, find it harder to identify certain um, chemical elements. And that's a discussion you need to have, obviously, with the scientists you're, um, you're talking to. Another type of site-specific non-invasive method that we can use is reflectance spectroscopy, um, which here I've called UV Visnir reflectance spectroscopy to reflect, <laughs> pardon the pun, the, the wavelength range in which I am actually collecting data, which is ultraviolet, visible, and near infrared. Um, but the technique itself is reflectance spectroscopy or spectrophotometry. You also hear it called FORS, 
which is, um, in, is the acronym of fiber optics reflectance spectroscopy. Again, these are all the same thing. Um, it, it, it can sound confusing, but um, it is really the same thing. Colorimetry in a way is also the same thing, but not as specific um, as this potentially. And what reflectance spectroscopy um, does um, is it measures the reflectance, um, the reflected light off a surface, um, a, a painted surface, for example. So what you're seeing here is two plots of light reflected off of um, um, a blue area at the top and a green area at the bottom from the manuscript um, of which you're seeing an opening on the left. And the presence, the very, um, the, the shape of the spectrum basically, and the presence of specific um, traps and peaks and um, absorptions at specific wavelengths identifies specific um, chemical compounds. So in the top spectrum, that spectrum is a marker is specific to smalt, a cobalt containing glassy pigment, which is found in the peacock feathers painted on the, the right hand side page on that manuscript. Whereas on the bottom, what we're seeing again, the specific peaks at the positions that are indicated on the graphs indicate the presence of copper sulfate, which is a green pigment, which is found in the medallion that Christ um, that holds Christ's robe there on the on the left hand so left hand um, page of that manuscript. Um, again, this is a, a, a non-invasive method. One couple of questions that you really want to ask if someone wants to use this um, is the wavelength range. So as I said, you know, here I'm talking about ultraviolet, visible, and near-infrared, and the range I'm exploring in this graph is from 350 nanometers, so that's just in the UV, all the way out to 2,500 nanometers, which is at the very end of the near-infrared. It's a very broad range. You can get lots of information. Lots of um, pieces of equipment for reflection spectroscopy will not analyze that broader range. It's a much um, smaller range, so you really need to ask that question because you don't get as much information. You need to look at a spot size, which is usually relatively large, a few millimeters. And you also need to ask about light levels because you are, you are um, shining potentially quite a bright light on your object, although for a very few seconds. So you, you, it's, it's the kind of question you want to ask the person um, you're working with. Um, and then you, we, um, you can use Raman spectroscopy. Um, which I won't really talk about much because you'll hear a lot more about it in the following talk. So I won't, um, I will not um, spend any time much. You can see various pictures here of various different types of equipment that can be used um, on, on special collections. And key questions around Raman spectroscopy are an excitation wavelength, spot size again, which can be very, very small actually for Raman. Um, the laser power at the sample, because you are shining a laser on your object, so you want to make sure you're not burning holes. Um, obviously, you need to keep your the laser power is really low. And also, again, the wavelength range that you're able to um, investigate. And I'll hand over to Laura now. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. So I will be talking about a few other uh, techniques uh, here in our non-invasive, non-destructive list of methods for um, spot analysis. Um, so Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, most often known as FTIR, is another workhorse in the field. So just like Paula mentioned, the XRF is a technique that we all use quite frequently and that many labs will actually have access to. FTIR is another one of these methods. And the two are used complementarily together to um, understand the composition of your sample. So FTIR spectroscopy is used to essentially identify the chemical bonds in a molecule, and it does that by irradiating infrared light at your sample. And that process in and of itself is not destructive. The infrared light will not damage the sample. It just causes it to vibrate in a specific way. And then from that information, we get a spectrum, uh, which is kind of a distinctive molecular fingerprint for that sample. So it can be used to identify different components, in a sample or uh, maybe elucid elucidate what's in a mixture of, um, inside your sample. So for example, we can use this technique to understand the difference between organic molecules. So things like, is this film made of cellulose acetate or is it made of cellulose nitrate? But the technique can also be used to identify some minerals. Um, th so things like extenders, fillers, and certain types of pigments that might be used in paints. So as you can see on the slide here, um, FTIR comes in a variety of forms as well. The far right 
image shows a portable or handheld instrument. So this one is held in your hand and can be brought to your collection in many cases. Um, and the two middle images actually show another very small and portable instrument. Um, and they can be used in different types of modes. So this is kind of means the way that the light is shown through the instrument at your sample. So you have the external reflectance um, instrument on the far left, which is uh, a non-invasive and non-destructive method. Um, and then you can also have a, a system where we call um, the setup attenuated total reflectance or ATR. And in this case, we see in the Im middle image here, you have a kind of plate where your sample is put. So in this situation, you might have to take a small sample from your um, uh, object, or if the object is actually able to be placed on this plate, you can place the whole object there. And then this arm uh, at the top of the instrument comes down and presses down on the object. And so that pressure might create a small indent on the surface, depending on how hard it's pushed down. So again, this is a technique that is traditionally um, can be made non-destructive, but it can also uh, make a small indent in your object, or you might have to take a sample out. And in particular, if you're using this method in combination with microscopy, so where you have the FTIR instrument coupled with a microscope, you do normally have to take a sample from your object. Um, but that can be very useful because the sample is very small. It's up to like a pinhead sized, for example, sample. But under the microscope, you can actually direct your infrared light at different parts of that, diff of that tiny sample and study different parts of the um, sample itself and gain compositional information. So some key questions to ask when working with FTIR, um, is, the, is the instrument going to be portable? Uh, can it be brought to my collection, of course? Um, do we need to take a sample or can it be done non-destructively? And if it is done non-invasively non and non-destructively, <laughs> I only learned this distinction this morning, Paula. Uh, <laughs> um, will, it is, is a high amount of pressure required because if you are using this kind of ATR setup, again, that might leave a small indent on the surface. So you have to be very careful there. Um, and another key question is whether reference samples are required. So if you're working with um, heritage scientists, they usually have access to large reference libraries that contain example spectra of the types of materials that we find in our collections uh, in different kind of degradation states as well, which is very useful. So they can compare your sample to that reference library. So it's something that you really want to make sure that the people you're working with have access to, or you might have to provide reference samples to compare your sample against. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some examples of FTIR in action. Um, you can see here the semi-portable instrument. So it's been attached to a stand, making it essentially a portable handheld sort of instrument <laughs> being held by a stand. Um, and this is being used in the reflectance setup. And you can see the spot size there in the middle of the slide is about two to three millimeters. So that's how, how big of an area the light will be shown onto. So if you have a mixture of different um, colorants there, you'll get a mixed spectrum containing um, both pigments, for example. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the handheld instrument, which is being kind of pressed up against a seal that you can't see at the bottom of this document. Um, but again, um, you can see that this instrument can be held in your hand and might require kind of a press down action onto the surface of that document. Next slide, please. And I will very briefly just mention microfade testing because I know that Kristen Dunn is giving a whole talk about this tomorrow morning. Um, so this technique is actually used more in conjunction with loans and exhibitions and um, in a way to assess how and under what conditions your objects might go on display in a safe way for them. So the method is very similar to the force technique that Paula talked about earlier. It uses um, a small fiber optic cable through which uh, light is shown onto your sample. And the, the spot size of that light is only about a third of a millimeter. So it's very small, which means you can focus it onto a single letter in a document. And what we're going to be doing here is unlike forest where you're just doing a quick shining of the light and seeing what comes off the surface and getting an understanding of the composition of the colorants there. What we're going to do is kind of continuously shine the light on that tiny little spot for about 10 minutes um, and see how that area changes when it's exposed to very bright light. So in essence, this is an accelerated aging test. 
on a very, very isolated area, which allows us to predict um, for how long and under how bright of a light our um, document can be displayed for without it undergoing huge changes. So that might be fading, it might be darkening, it might be any sort of change to the color um, of the object. So this method is uh, very useful for uh, loans teams and for exhibitions, and it allows us to make some informed decisions about allowing access to our um, documents. So if you have um, items that you are worried about might be vulnerable for going on display, you might want to talk to um, people that have access to microfading to help you determine under what light conditions to have those objects displayed. Next slide, please. So now we're going to dive into the world of invasive destructive analysis. So these types of techniques, as Paula explained, generally um, interact with your object. They might require, a, they do require a sample usually, um, and that sample can be destroyed in the process of analysis. And again, they give us site-specific information. So because you're taking a little sample from one area of your, let's say, giant manuscript, you're only going to gain information about that area, but you can speculate from that information about the composition of the rest of the object usually. Um, What's wonderful about these techniques is that they're very detailed in their anal analytical um, capacity and they'll give you highly specific um, identification uh, that's un usually unambiguous about the composition of your sample. So a really key question when you're working with this kind of techniques is how will my sample be used up? Um, because you, you will essentially not have your sample at the end of this kind of analysis, if you want to have multiple techniques used to analyze your sample, which you usually do because these kinds of methods work in complementarity with each other, you want to make sure that the scientists you're working with have a very clear methodological approach. So maybe they'll do um, XRF first and then they'll do Raman and then at the end they might do this kind of destructive analysis. So making sure that your sample can be kind of put through um, a pipeline of analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I will talk very briefly about these very complex techniques here, and um, you'll hear about them probably in Matthew Collins' talk, I think this afternoon. And so I will just only mention here briefly a very large umbrella of um, techniques that fall under the term chromatography. So if you recall back to your childhood days, uh, most of us did this uh, fun experiment where we would take a piece of coffee filter paper and you put a dab of black marker pen at the bottom and you dip the bottom of that paper in the water and as the water travels up the filter paper you would see your marker uh, pen ink also travel up with the waterfront and separate into different colors and then you would see that that marker pen ink is actually composed of a variety of different colored inks. So this is in essence what chromatography does. It's a technique that's used to separate a very complex mixture of molecules into its constituents components. And so we do this usually by running our sample, which is usually a very small, tiny sample from your item, um, through a column. And you kind of push it through that column either using liquid or gas. And as it travels down the length of this column, it, separate out, it separates out based on things like, for example, size. So if there's smaller molecules in your mixture, they might come out first and then larger ones might come out later or vice versa, depending on the kind of column you're using. And in that way, you can uh, then collect at the end of the column, each one of these molecules as they come out and then you can identify them. So this technique is incredibly uh, useful. As I said, it can be done with a, a liquid pushing your sample through, which is called high performance liquid chromatography or it can be done with a gas pushing the sample through, which is called gas chromatography. And you'll see this quite frequently, it's called GC. So, um, and again, it's very important that you work with a team here that has experience working with your specific kind of collections or understands that you're going to be presenting them with an unknown um, sample that might have degraded material. So these techniques are very commonly used in chemistry labs all over the world. Um, However, they might not have the reference libraries to be able to identify your complex historical mixed samples. So chromatography is often um, coupled with mass spectrometry. 
Uh, and mass spectrometry basically is a, is a way to obtain the weight and the chemical structure of each of those molecules as they come out of that column at the end. Um, so again, we're dealing with an unknown mixture of things here. So knowing how much they weigh, knowing to some degree what their shape is um, of each one as they come out, and then maybe combining that information with other techniques that we've talked about earlier will, will allow us to completely um, characterize that sample in each component within that sample. So these, these methods are very, very powerful. And you might be familiar with um, Matthew's project um, where he is identified with his collaborators, identifying a, a number of different types of parchment, um, the kind of animal and even the sex and the age of the animals and kind of seeing where all over the world these animals were being uh, raised and used to create these manuscripts. So you can really gain powerful information with these methods. Um, so I think I hand over here to Paula. Yes, thanks, Laura. Um, and I'm, I'm going to zoom through imaging uh, methods and scanning methods, because I think we really want to get to um, the more juicy part of the questions um, later. Um, but yeah, we, I, we do want to talk just briefly about um, imaging or scanning methods, which tend to be both non-invasive and non-destructive. And the first thing I want to say is that there isn't a difference between imaging and scanning. And that's mostly a difference in how you obtain what is in effect then an image or a series of images. Um, so when we talk about imaging, we're talking about a single shot or scan using something like a camera, which produces an image. So um, it's a single acquisition, um, which lasts a relatively short amount of time and will give you some sort of image or series of images about your, the whole, for example, page of the manuscript you're analyzing. Scanning is a different process. When you're scanning, you are obtaining an image, but you are obtaining it um, point by point by sort of raster scanning. So by moving either your detector or your object, um, in the case of books, um, most usually you will be moving your detector um, sort of along lines in order to cover the whole surface um, that you're interested in. And then you're gonna put all this data together to obtain a single image or a series of images. So you're still, the end result is the same. You're still obtaining images, but um, you're doing it in, in two different ways. And, and then the other thing to mention is mapping. So a lot of time you'll hear people um, talk about XRF mapping, for example. What we're really doing actually, for example, with XRF is we are scanning. So XRF scanners um, collect single X-ray spectra at lots of different locations by raster scanning the surface on an object. And then what you do is you put all of the spectra together and you can start mapping, um, for example, chemical elements in the case of XRF or um, functional groups, chemical bonds uh, in the case of FTIR scanning. So depending on what type of, of scanning you use or imaging you're using, you can map different types of um, elements or bonds or pigments or materials. So we call that, um, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm showing here, for example, um, is a manuscript fragment, which has been scanned by both XREF and FTIR scanning. Um, and what we've extracted in this case is in the image at the center is a map of the potassium um, present in this, in this cutting. Um, Whereas what you see on the right is a map of the functional group um, silicon oxygen, the stretching mode of the silicon oxygen bond. Um, and both of these um, both of these maps, so the potassium and the silicon oxygen bond, both point to the presence of ultramarine blue, lapis lazuli. Sorry for the typo there in the lapis. Um, so we're using different types of methods in this case to um, substantiate each other, to support each other and make sure that what the potassium is telling us is the same thing that the silicon is telling us. So yes, we do have lapis at those locations. Um, and that's actually that they match most of the blue present um, on this fragment. Um, so this that was just a a way to distinguish sort of imaging from scanning from mapping. There are loads of different methods um, to do imaging and, and scanning and therefore mapping. 
um, we don't really have time to go through them in any sort of detail. I really briefly want to um, mention or, or try to, um, to help um, distinguish between near infrared imaging and infrared reflectography. Infrared imaging is a very sort of broad term that people tend to use in a very broad way, but you, if, if you're interested in doing imaging, if people talk about doing infrared imaging, you really want to pin down uh, what are they talking about? Are they talking about near infrared imaging, which is imaging um, in the near infrared, um, which, sorry, it's not very clear here, but near infrared imaging basically usually means imaging done up to about 1000 nanometers. So in the near infrared proper, which is between 700 and 1000 nanometers. Um, infrared reflectography usually means you're looking further out into the infrared in what some people call the short wave infrared between about 1000 and 2500 nanometers. And the way, the reason it matters where you're looking is that the contrast between different materials changes even significantly between different uh, portions of the, of the spectrum, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what you're seeing here, for example, um, in, in sort of um, that light beige or yellow, that is a spectrum of parchment, which is, as you, um, as you can see, quite um, bright. It's quite transparent throughout this whole uh, wavelength range. And at the bottom, that's a carbon black ink. And what you're looking, what you're looking for when you're doing imaging is the contrast between the ink or the pigment, whatever it is you want to image, and the substrate. Um, and the higher that contrast, the easier it will be to um, identify, to see that, that image. Um, so just to, um, to show you an example, um, and I apologize, this is not from, from library material, but it's a lovely painting. So I hope you will um, forgive me using it. Um, what you're seeing here is a near infrared image, a detail of the, of the face of um, Ginevra da Vinci by Leonardo da Vinci. And it's, it's a good image. Um, it's quite high resolution. And you can almost see, you can see a little bit that there is some um, pouncing um, along the, the outline of, um, of her eyes. But then if we use infrared reflectography um, and go further out into the infrared, this, this is the image you get. And pouncing now is apparent not just around the eyes, but on her eyebrows, around the nose, around the mouth, around the whole jawline. So this is the contrast between um, this, the, the base layer and the, sorry, the support um, and, the, and the pouncing is so much stronger in this image that you can see so much better. This is the previous image and that's the next one. Um, so it really matters where you're looking at into the infrared. Um, and then also very briefly, um, a quick mention of multi and hyperspectral imaging, um, also called imaging spectroscopy. The difference, the real difference between these two, multi and hyperspectral, is basically in the number of bands, of spectral bands, which means the, the number of images you are collecting. You, can, you can't really talk about hyperspectral imaging unless you're collecting hundreds of images. And they are um, images collected in very narrow spectral bands. Um, if, if you're only collecting a few to a few tens of images, you're really talking about multi-spectral. Um, and those, um, the spectral bands, so the, the, the wavelet ranges you're collecting images in could, can be quite large. Um, the main difference between the two is that what you get out of these two types of images are um, spectra, which are in this case reflectance spectra, um, which with very different resolution. So you can see um, there are two spectral plots, one in the middle, one in the right. The one in the middle, the spectra aren't really well resolved. I mean, you can see some of their features, but the features aren't as good as the ones that you can see in the other, in the other spectra, simply because you've got more points to build your spectrum. Uh, so it's a resolution, the spectral resolution that increases significantly with hyperspectral. And another note, um, it, which is really key, I think, unless images, the images that you're collected in several spectral bands are calibrated, in most cases, that will be a calibration to reflectance. In some cases, it could be to fluorescence, luminescence. You can't call it spectral imaging. Um, lots of, um, some people will collect images in different bands. So for example, um, 
um, do some sort of false color infrared. So collect an image in a red, a green, um, a blue, and a near infrared band and call that multispectral imaging. It really isn't unless they've calibrated to reflectance. That's just multi-band imaging. It's still useful. You can still get some information by collecting images in different spectral bands and comparing them and putting them together, but you're not, you don't get any spectra, proper spectra out of it. So you can't, you can't call it spectral imaging. Um, I'll skip through that um, and hand over back to Laura. Sure thing. Do come to our um, Q and A's at lunchtime because I think there's just so much interesting and useful information that we're unable to really cover. I know we've just skipped about 10 slides of imaging. So really, really a key uh, bit of all of this, I have to say, is what happens to the information that you're gaining um, and your data. And quite often, there are so many little things that we forget about and we don't think about until you're writing this manuscript or your paper, you know, six months later. So some tips, make sure you write down everything, absolutely everything. I know that in the moment you'll think, of course, I'll remember this. It's only the number five, but actually <laughs> in six months, you won't remember it. So make sure you write down everything. Um, make sure the data that is acquired, whether you're acquiring the data or somebody is doing that for you, make sure all the metadata is there that needs to be there. And you might need to speak with the experts who kind of go through what metadata is available to you, like what instrument was used, what kind of light was used, what range of the spectrum, what resolution, all of these things are going to be useful to you when you're writing this up for publication or for your records. If you're doing any sort of complex imaging, um, hyperspectral imaging or multiband imaging, make sure that you uh, know what kind of resolution requirements you have um, if you would like to have those images available online, for example, maybe talk to your digital services department because they'll be able to give you information on what kind of resolution and metadata they might need with that imaging, um, with those images. So especially if you want to do something like IIIF, which is becoming very popular now for sharing images online, uh, make sure you've spoken to someone about what kind of metadata and resolution is needed there. Uh, make sure that your data is saved and that it's backed up. Um, and maybe think about some data management planning. So how much of this data will you be collecting? When will you review it? How long will you keep it for? How will you share it with your partners? Um, and making sure that it's accessible to you and to your collaborators. So quite frequently, the instruments that we've described, they all come with their own proprietary software and that software will generate spectra and data that can only be opened with that company's software. So make sure that you have access to that data in a raw file that's maybe exported into a notepad or into an ASCII file so that you can regraph it, even if that means regraphing it in Excel, whatever you need, and make sure that you have access to your actual data. Plan in advance with your collaborators about what you will do with the data, how you will share it, when you should expect to get the results if you've given them a sample, um, what you'll do with the, any intellectual property that's produced. And that's really important if, for example, somebody has requested to study your collection and you've given them permission to do that, you might want to consider saying, okay, there will be an embargo on you talking about your findings until you've told us what your findings are. There's nothing worse than waking up with you know, an article in the sun about some amazing or wacky discovery that was found in your collection that you didn't even know um, the results of that study had been completed. And maybe this won't bother you too much, but if you have a media and comms department, they will be very upset. <laughs> so these are things that you can actually see um, described in the ethical sampling agreement that I mentioned earlier. And again, this is linked to in our bibliography that we'll share with you as well as um, if you look on the British Museum's uh, sampling agreement, which is also linked in that document, it creates a great framework for considering how to approach collaborative, destructive or non-destructive analysis of your collection with external collaborators. So thinking about all these things about data sharing and use and reuse. And of course, um, how will the data be stored in the future for how long and can you make it open access? Next slide, please. Um, and of course, how do we gain access to all this equipment? 
So usually through collaboration, unless you're lucky enough to work in an institution that has its own heritage science lab. And even then we often collaborate because we don't all have the same instruments. Um, so your first uh, mode of action might be exactly what you're doing right now, going to a conference, seeing what people are doing, networking, meeting people, going to events and workshops, contacting authors of publications that are relevant to you is a fantastic way as well to gain um, a kind of a collaborative traction. So if you contact academics or museum conser conservation scientists who you can find either through the websites or through the publications that I just mentioned, um, you should be prepared with some understanding of what you want to do and more importantly, why you want to do it. Give them some incentive, um, be concise and be prepared to fill out some request forms like the ones I've just mentioned. Uh, be considerate about who might have the time to do that analysis. Uh, museum conservators do often have the time to do collaborative work with others, but very limited amounts of it. So unless it's key interest to them and to their organization, you might have to consider whether you yourself have to collect the data with some training, or perhaps you can work with an academic who has some students or um, internships and placements that you can do collaborative research through if the project is very interesting to them. Um, and if it begins to grow and, and there's a case study or a pilot study and it, it gathers some traction, maybe you can consider applying for a grant with that partner organization if your own organization is able to do that, um, or you might have to work as a project partner on a bigger project. When you do that, make sure that you know what you are getting out of the project and your voice is heard because different um, collaborators in these very multidisciplinary projects will have different aims and needs. So ensure that your voice is heard and that you've described very clearly um, what you will be getting out of this collaboration. Next slide, please. A great way to find access to instruments is the National Heritage Science Forum's kit catalog. And this again, the National Heritage Science Forum is linked to in our document. I won't go into details about what they are or what they do, um, but check them out. They're fantastic. Both Paula and I are active members. And the kit catalog is an online catalog where all the members of the forum have listed their instruments and how they can be accessed. So if you go to that page, you'll see the instruments, what they are, and what kind of access uh, you might have to them. And next slide, please. There's also the Institute of Conservation's Heritage Science Group, or ICON's HSG. Um, ICON is a fantastic place to um, reach out to the heritage science community working in a variety of organizations. And they also run uh, all sorts of workshops. Some of these are from a few years ago, pre-pandemic, but you can see um, microfading workshop was run, XRF workshop was run. In fact, that's how Paula and I met Bob at one of these workshops that were run collaboratively, I believe with NHSF and ICON. Maybe I forgot now. No, okay. Well, it was a workshop. So there are many of these workshops happening, so keep a lookout for them. But do follow ICON and NHSF even on social media and you might uh, hear about these workshops much more easily that way. Okay, I'll pick up here, I think, um, and really briefly mention that, of course, that our commercial services, um, we, we're mentioning to here, we are not endorsing them in, in any way. They were just easy, really easy to find online because uh, they've got good websites. Um, so there are a few really good commercial services around. Um, there might be smaller ones um, local to you, which um, might be harder to find, but your local um, even your local academics or collections people or museum people might might know them well. And I should say, I guess, about um, that, obviously, a when, when you're hiring, using a commercial service, you're prepared to pay. That might also need to be the case when you're collaborating or using a museum scientist labs. In some cases, even museum um, labs offer sort of semi-commercial um, services or at least need to recoup costs on, on analysis time, um, be prepared to think about, um, about that. Another way to find equipment is the National Equipment Portal, which um, at least in theory includes all the analytical equipment um, held by UK higher education um, research institutes. So lots of universities and you can search by university, you can search by type of equipment. So this could be a good way to, to start um, your search for equipment if you know what type of equipment you, you're looking for. Obviously, what you're going to find here is not necessarily equipment which is used by a team familiar with heritage science work. 
So you, again, you need, as, as Laura mentioned, um, it's not just enough to find a scientist that knows how to use that technique. Ideally, you'd want someone who's used that technique on the type of samples or the type of objects you're interested in, because historical objects are aged, complex, um, usually not made to standard recipes. So, you know, scientists working in modern chemistry labs might not necessarily be um, aware of all these complexities and might find it harder to interpret the data from a, a, an aged um, complex um, sample. Um, one thing we wanted, really wanted to say is that recently there's been a, um, a really big push from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and, and UKRI, which is the U, um, UK Research Institute, uh, Infra Institute, yes, to um, equip more and more labs across the UK with infrastructure for heritage science. Um, there's a really cool um, blog post, very recent from the 1st of September, um, written by Tao Chan, the head of infrastructure for HRC, and she talks about how, just how much um, um, investment in infrastructure um, the government has, has made in the, in the last couple of years, and there's more coming. And most excitingly, I think, for the heritage science sector, in uh, November of last year, uh, HSC granted um, about 25 million um, investment into heritage science infrastructure to 42 institutions across the UK. So our, our collective heritage science infrastructure is really growing. Um, I think not all of us have yet had time to upload all our kit to the NHSF kit catalog, but we will get there. You know, there's more and more coming. Um, so it, it's definitely a field that is expanding and there are, you know, increasing possibilities to do this kind of work. Um, and this is true in the UK. It's also you at your true at European level. So the EU has been funding um, research programs and infrastructure in heritage science since 2004. Um, the current project is called Iperion HS, um, and it's a it's a really collaborative project across twenty three countries, including the UK, providing um, um, all sorts of services, both um, well providing training, providing events, but also providing actually service access to equipment, um, both mobile and fix MoLab and fix lab are the two. Um, acronyms you might hear, and also to archives for um, conservation and scientific data on collections. Um, and the hope is that all of this sort of European infrastructure will then develop into ERIS, the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, um, which the UK should actually be part of. This is not um, thankfully linked to the European Union, so it doesn't matter if we're not part of the Union. This is um, just Europe. So, um, we're hoping in the next um, year or few years that the infrastructure will be developed as a sustainable long-term um, program and, and series of services, which will mean that, again, collectively in the UK, we'll have more and more access to heritage science um, services, skill sets um, and infrastructure. Um, and I think that's it for us. We're happy to take questions. Obviously. Yeah, I was just coming back there. Can you just stop sharing yes. your screen at the moment, Paula, and we'll open up for questions. I'll just, that was fantastic. just want to say thanks for both of you. Uh, and I should just reiterate that, that a lot of the information there, when, when I first heard this, was in a day-long workshop. So you can see there's an awful lot to, to cram in there. It's, it can be slightly overwhelming. Um, and But this is being recorded, so you can go back and revisit some of these things again. Uh, and just to, to say, Paolo and Laura, I think you've also you've uploaded to Whova a bibliography, um, I believe. Is that right? With with a lot of the, the information. We have and we'll upload the slides as well. Great. I just need to PDF them and I'll, I'll do that later today. There you go. Yeah. And you can see why we say that it's a, it's a jargon buster session. There's an awful lot of, uh, of, of acronyms involved in this area. So it can be uh, you, you do need to have some idea. Uh, or it helps to have some some extra um, uh, resources to help navigate them. Now we've got about ten minutes um, for questions before we we move on to the next one. Um, and if you've got a specific question you want to actually chat to to Paula or, or Laura about maybe your own context, your own institution, uh, that type of thing. Um, what rather if it's a bit more involved, what you might want to do is hold on uh, and and pop along with your with your sandwiches uh, at lunchtime to the, the, their office hours. Uh, Laura is going to be talking today at 12.30, uh, is, is, is holding court and will be able to answer your questions and then Paola tomorrow at 12.30 at the same time. Uh, and that is within Hoover uh, in the 
uh, try and find it here though, the, the, the meetups and virtual meetings section of Hoover, so you'll be able to find it in there. Um, now, questions please uh, at this point, so to remind you, uh, to, uh, to ask your questions, it's either if you can just put your hand up within the, um, within the, 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 the Zoom features, that'll be down in your uh, reactions window probably, uh, or you can actually post a question in the chat as well. So I've got one question that's come in here in the chat. Uh, I'm going to uh, offices from Jane Gallagher. Uh, offer Jane the chance to to actually uh, speak the question rather than type it. Jane, uh, or should, would you prefer me to read it out? I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. That's fine. And I can say it. Sorry, I just had to put everything on there. Um, <laughs> Can you hear me is the main thing. Um, yeah, thanks so much. That was really interesting and really, really helpful. And I just wondered if, if you guys had any advice you could give around um, if you're working with researchers who may not be aware of the techniques or, you know, you've got researchers there that you need to try and reach out to to bring in to, to make them aware of techniques where you've got either you can offer some of the techniques in house or, you know, people who can offer those techniques. Do you have any suggestions for kind of starting off those conversations or raising awareness? So do you mean that the, sorry, I might be misunderstanding your question, but the researchers are historians and you, you would like to make them aware of the kind of scientific techniques? Okay, yeah. I think mostly humanities, I think, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think these kinds of conferences are a great, great place to start, certainly. There's a lot of actually fantastic social media that's happening these days that people can, I mean, for example, the Met Science team has a fantastic Instagram page that's always kind of showing examples of the kind of discoveries they're making. Um, a lot of organizations do publicize the stuff um, on their social media and, and things like that, blogs, but we have linked to a number of um, beginner kind of intro um, review articles in our bibliography that you can send to people that, that will give them a kind of, the, um, the Royal Society of Chemistry publishes these, they're called technical briefs or technical bulletins, TBs, um, and they're on the different techniques, several of the techniques we've mentioned today, and the, they're meant to be for, for exactly for humanists, for non-specialists, so they should be using language that's accessible and allows you to gain an understanding of what the technique is, why you would use it, and how you would use it in a very straightforward way, so that's a great place to start. And I would also say if you find sometimes, you know, in, in mainstream media, you know, once in a while, something like like the Vinland map was on last week, I think, you know, macro XRF mapping has revealed it's definitely a fake. If you find a good mainstream media article that uses heritage type techniques and it's on the type of material that maybe you've got in your collection, that could be a good hook. You know, it's like, look, what kind of things. And then from there, you can go into more specialized um, bibliography, I guess. But just to get people interested and hooked, that might be another way to do it. Hey, thank you. Great. Thanks. I've got another question here from Elizabeth Henderson in the chat. Uh, I'll take it, Elizabeth, you just want me to read it out. Um, she says that was fascinating. And she just wants to ask about the relationship between um, um, when a work has been done on one of our objects and then the catalogue record itself. In other words, how should we make readers more aware of this kind of work has been done when uh, this sort of research has been carried out on a book or a manuscript? Um, I think it's a great question. Um, and then so I can speak from my own experience with the Fitzwilliam. For us, it's very, this is very much a work in progress. It's something we've been thinking about um, quite a bit. And what we're hoping to do um, soon is, um, first of all, find a way to um, make this visible in our own, you know, behind the scenes sort of collections and management system, because it's not even there yet. So that's going to be the first step, you know, create different types of, of records for different types of analysis, potentially different types of images. And then there's a, I think there's a decision at institutional level of what level of information you want to push from your, you know, in-house. Uh, or behind the scenes content management system up to your website, to your um, outfit, you know, outward facing collections. Um, you know, you might not want to publish full technical reports, for example. You could, however, perhaps say, yes, imaging, you know, you could have drop down menus or tick boxes, say different kinds of analysis have been made. You could definitely link to publications. So if any publications come out, that's a really, you know, good way to, to show that an object, you know, 
it's just part of your bibliography on the on the object at that point right um so that's another good way to do it um but it, it's a good question and i don't i don't think i have um you know full answer to it yeah, it's, I think it's very, at the moment, it's still very dependent on the organization that you work with, uh, what their capacity is and what their interest is. So you really, I mean, definitely, you have to work with your digital services department, let them know that you're doing this kind of work in the first place, because many times they don't know that that's even a thing or, um, that exists or is a possibility. And once they're aware, usually they'll find this very interesting because, you know, a large part of their work is to enable access to the collections online. Um, and to allow readers to access a kind of more material, like a fuller material picture of something that's been digitized or available to them in the digital realm. So how they then go about integrating this information, the imaging, the, the data into that catalog information is going to be a long, long, <laughs> hopefully not difficult conversation that you lead together. And like Paula said, it might start with just looking first within your own department, you know, how do you integrate this information into your uh, conservation documentation or something like that and then you build up to that um outward facing um display of it but yeah it, it's it's there's i don't think there's um uh frameworks in place yet to to do this kind of that are um the same everywhere thanks for that laura I think we've got uh, a chance for one more question at the moment. And remember, you, you can come along at lunchtime uh, with, with further questions. Uh, this is a great one uh, from Emmy Medard Muhumutsa, I think it is. Apologies if that's not how you pronounce that. Uh, who says that they are a, a, a librarian from Uganda uh, and they've started an online course uh, on Wiki, uh, Wikipedia for libraries. Basically, what they want to know is that um, I think what sort of resources there are available in this area uh, in other in in, Af in Uganda or Africa and how how they can find out about that. So you shared quite a lot about uh, uh, about the European Union for example. Is, do you have any idea how they might find out more about about uh, other parts of the world? It's a good question, and I um, I'm afraid I don't really know. I think our field is well developed for sure and it's quite you know close-knit in Europe the North America so the US in particular um, increasingly more in places like Mexico um, and some areas um, some countries in Asia you know China um, Japan Qatar um, I'm not entirely sure what's going on in Africa much Laura you I don't know if you know more I, I do. I have seen um, publications from group in Northern Africa, from several groups in Northern Africa and also in South Africa. Um, but I would look into international organizations like the IIC, um, yeah. and they often have uh, much, much more in-depth information and uh, available kind of um, networking opportunities, leadership opportunities and um, development opportunities for these specific subsets within conservation where heritage science often goes into the kind of conservation and yeah. preservation world um, and so they have the ability to um, connect you with people um, within kind of more local areas as well as connect you with people in Europe and all over the world as well for doing this kind of work so that you can then get information about developing your own um, organization's needs so IIC is a good one ICROM is another good one we should put these we'll put these in the chat so that you guys have access to them yeah, and ICOM CC and well. ICOM CC, yeah. So we'll yeah. we'll link to those in the chat. Yeah, and I, I would just add that IFLA, uh, the International Federation of Library Associ Association, should also uh, might be a good place to to check their resources out. We've got a couple of uh, of IFLA members attending today. I know uh, you might be able to speak more to that. However, we're, we are uh, that was quite a, a short little bit for questions because we had so much to cram into that first jargon buster session. So. Uh, we're going to move on now uh, to the next um, uh, speakers, so I'm going to, to introduce them just now, if you bear with me while I find my, my bit of paper. <laughs> so our, our next uh, two speakers for the next presentation, the first is um, Richard Gamison, who's a Professor of the History of the Book at Durham University. Uh, Richard has published more than 100 studies of medieval manuscripts, book collections, um, uh, 
Uh, his, um, his most recent work is the Medieval uh, Manuscripts of Trinity College, Oxford, a descriptive catalogue, which was published in 2018. And, the, and in collaboration with uh, chemist colleagues, he's currently the first ever history of, uh, he's, he's working on the first ever history of British illuminators pigments. Uh, and speaking with Richard will be Andy Beebe, who is Professor of Chemistry at the Centre for Molecular and Nanoscale Electronics at the Institute of Medieval um, and Early Modern Studies at Durham University. Andy's interests lie in optical spectroscopy, that is using light to analyze materials. And he and his collaborators have built instruments to analyze the pigments made in manuscripts, employing visible and near infrared light to identify material in a non-contact, non-invasive and non-damaging way. Uh, so I would like to introduce them and their talk today is, going, is called The Story of the Blues, Identifying and Understanding Illuminators Pigments and Their Deployment. Good morning, Bob, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this meeting. As you can see, Richard and I are going to do a double act this morning. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've, we're sharing an office, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, hand up from one to the other. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my, my screen. Here's the, the first presentation, hopefully, or the first slide. Hopefully you can all see that okay. That's, uh, oh, I'll, I'll take it as good. Um, so let me tell you about some of the work that uh, we've been doing here um, in Durham as part of the, the Team Pigment project uh, that Richard and I started about uh, nine years ago now. Oops. So Team Pigment um, formed back in 2012, and it was a collaboration between myself, a card-carrying chemist, who's been working in the field of spectroscopy for basically my entire career. Uh, and I was introduced to Richard, who, as you introduced him, is a professor of the history of the book, uh, a walking Wikipedia on legs when it comes to medieval manuscripts. Um, and we've also recruited Kate Nicholson. Kate was a postdoc here in chemistry looking at crystallization in, in micro um, my cells. And uh, she was so turned on by the idea of looking at the manuscripts, Kate also joined as a spectroscopy expert and is still part of the team. Our first real study of manuscripts came in 2013 when we started looking at the insular gospels and local manuscripts that came together as part of the uh, exhibition of the Lindisfarne gospels. And it became apparent during that um, exhibition, during the work we did then, that there was an interesting story, an interesting um, set of work to be done, in particular because we saw trends, changes in pigment use with time. And so we suggested that, uh, you know, that this might be a, a feature worth continuing uh, our research in that area. But Richard made it very clear in order to prosecute that kind of campaign, we'd need to move outside of Durham. And so a year later, we started um, developing mobile instrumentation and moving on to other libraries outside of Durham. And just an example there, our most recent trip was um, just about two weeks ago now at Corpus Christi in Cambridge. And to date, we've studied over 300 British manuscripts as part of our study, plus many other objects along the way. We often get asked while we're somewhere, can you just look at this? And in fact, if you look in the picture here, this is one of our, uh, our um, shelfies, as we call them. Um, here's a shelf of us standing in front of the, uh, the Hereford Mapamundi which we are analysing using Raman and reflectance spectroscopy. So the challenge then that I was presented with, it became very apparent early on that any analysis that we do must be non-destructive and non-contact. It was uh, drilled into me quite forcefully by our conservation staff here in Durham that sampling was absolutely forbidden. And therefore our approach has been a very, uh, if you pardon the pun, a light touch insofar as we can only really interact with the sample using light electromagnetic radiation. And that has to be at sufficiently low level so as to cause no damage to the object. Clearly, uh, as Paola alluded in her presentation, if you turn up the light, any type of light, the X-rays, uh, Raman, uh, Raman laser, or, or even the force system, you can bring about thermal and photochemical damage to a sample. So any method that we use has got to be very gentle very and um, very light touch. So I said there, our early studies indicated that we saw systematic trends in pigment use with period and, and societal change. And that led us on to our current project, which is the pigments of British illuminators from the seventh to 15th century, a scientific and cultural investigation, which sounds very much like something Magnus Magnuson will be saying to introduce you for your, your speciality question. 
uh, on Mastermind. And, and I should say that there will be a book produced with this title uh, and um, hopefully you'll have it on your Christmas list in years to come. As part of this project, we want to study a coherent series of books that have been produced in various centres over the ages. And that means that we have to move around libraries around the UK. And that means moving equipment to those libraries. And that really isn't a trivial undertaking. We have to have mobile instrumentation. And the other thing to point out is that a lot of commercial instrumentation, the equipment that uh, people would buy off the shelf from instrument manufacturers, is really not suited to the study of manuscripts. So, for example, the Raman spectrometers that uh, were shown by Paula in her presentation, these systems were really designed for materials research, typically, or biochemical research, and they use conditions and uh, sampling accessories that are really not uh, friendly to the use of manuscripts. That the Fors instruments that are used quite uh, frequently commercially were originally designed for looking at rocks and stones outside their, their lookable bits of kit to, to, look at, um, to, to look at minerals. So some of it's travel friendly, but, but not always. So I'm in trouble with this slide. Um, the one thing I will point out that uh, the analysis of manuscripts, the analysis of anything really in chemistry is really Sherlock Holmes. We, we've been indoctrinated with this, this um, forensic science culture art in the media where the magic machine uh, takes a sample that's been plucked from somewhere and then on a screen seconds later appears the, uh, the picture of the molecule and its history and so on and so forth. That really is science fiction, science fact is gaining clues from the samples that we have, gaining little snippets of information, ruling out the impossible and suggesting the possible. And this is the approach that we need to use in our analysis of the books. So I'm gonna quickly run you through the techniques that we use within our uh, portfolio of, of uh, instrumentation and explain why it's suitable and what information it can give about certain pigments, uniquely about certain pigments, in give us a gold standard, an analytical method for certain pigments, certain techniques are the, are the, the method of choice. So the first one that's been mentioned today already is Raman spectroscopy. And essentially molecules made up of atoms, you should never trust an atom, they make everything up. Uh, the atoms are moving, they're jiggling around all the time and vibrating with very characteristic fingerprints. The fingerprint depends on the mass of the atoms and the type of bond between them. So if we can record that vibrational spectrum, then we uh, can understand we get a fingerprint for the molecule. Now, the way we're going to do that is we're going to shine a laser onto the page. A laser is a single pure color of light, or we look at the light that gets bounced off, scattered by the molecules, and a tiny, tiny fraction of that light comes out at a slightly different wavelength. The difference between what went in and what comes out is actually the vibrational frequency, the vibrational wave number of the molecule, that gives us the fingerprint. So if we can get the vibrational spectrum, we can get the fingerprint of the molecule. Now, the chances are you heard one word in that uh, short explanation, that was laser. And your perception of lasers is, again, uh, coloured by the, uh, the media. We're used to lasers being these dark Vader weapons that will cut through anything that uh, is put in front of them. Well, let me reassure you, under the right conditions and with care, that is far from the truth. It really isn't uh, a problem. Um, Rama spectroscopy can provide unique and very subtle differentiation between materials. So in looking at this book, this is an old gospel book from the Durham Cathedral Collection, an eighth century manuscript. Um, we can see here there's a, a red infill of this dragon's head and there are some scribal marks also in the text up here. When we record Raman spectra from these different areas, we see that the original stratum is pure pristine red lead, whereas the scribal mark here is contaminated by another lead oxide, Massico. And this indicates, A, it's a different batch of ink. And in fact, now knowing what we know about the time course of the development of red lead pigments, this suggests this is a later addition to the manuscript because chemists and, and the scribes making these books were chemists. Chemists making their red lead in later years were actually not as good at the chemistry as the, uh, as the scribes of, of the, uh, the eighth century. And so you see this contamination and Raman, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, we've also heard about diffuse reflectance, reflectance spectroscopy, and reflectance spectroscopy is painfully simple. We shine light on a sample and look at the spectrum of the scattered and reflected light. And the reflectance spectrum is simply the ratio of the scattered light divided by the instant light. 
As Paola said, we typically do this via fiber optics. Fiber optics are simply a convenient way of transporting light from one place to another. They're like hose pipes. You put light on one end, it comes out the other end, and you can wiggle them around. So it's sometimes referred to as fours. And, and this can be ultraviolet through to mid-infrared radiation. It's, it's, um, it's possible to send all different wavelengths of light down a fiber now. And just to show you some spectra here, these are some reflectance spectra. And you'll notice I've added here a small visible spectrum. These spectra are spanning from 400 through to about 2600 nanometers. And so different pigments show with uh, characteristically different spectra. And even the same pigment, these are all yellow ochres along the bottom here. You'll see that in the visible near infrared up to about 1000 nanometers, they've got common features. But actually in the short wave infrared between 13 and 2600 nanometers, there are differences here indicating um, the origin of the pigment. Some of these are, are uh, synthetic ochre and some of these are natural ochres. And these bands here are telling us about the origin of the natural ochres. The final method is this hyperspectral imaging where essentially we're taking images of a manuscript or images of the book through different color filters or using different colored illumination sources or a combination of the two. And that allows us to then play games with those images to bring out contrast to image um, different things in, in the manuscript. So you can see hidden or features that you can't see by eye. Um, early on, we had a real problem in moving our equipment. This is uh, our moving of the Raman instrument to Power Screen Library. Uh, this equipment weighs about a third of a ton, takes a week to move it from one place to the other. Um, I did mention at the beginning, um, commercial systems. This is a commercial system purchased by a conservation suite at a university in the UK. This system was uh, sold to my uh, conservation friend here, uh, Justin, as something that would be sensible to use on his painting. Uh, what I want to show you quickly is, oh, it's not gonna work, excuse me one second. Ah, oh, no, sorry about that, I've crashed out of it. Right. Don't worry, Andy, take, take your time, it's fine. That's no problem, we're back. Uh, that's the wrong window, oh dear, that's not, back. Share. Here we go. So here's Justin's video. Um, as you see the laser come on, you'll see a spot of light appear and then a waft of smoke. And this is actually, it stopped smoking now because it's drilled a hole straight through the painting. And poor old Justin was most disappointed that his painting had been damaged by the laser. This is because the output power of this laser is way, way too high uh, and it simply burns through the, the, the pigment and the object in front of it. The system that we employ has been designed to be specifically um, manuscript safe. We're using laser powers down around a half a milliwatt, so less than half a percent of this power. And we know from both reference samples that we've explored and from others in the group and in the literature um, in the community that uh, these power levels are safe and non-damaging. So here is our mobile system that we've developed specifically for looking at manuscripts. It's low optical power, um, it's mobile and portable. And as you can see here, we've got a gantry that allows us to move this system and adapt it to look at anything from a book the size of a matchbox to massive Bibles through to wall paintings. The great thing about this kit is that it's very portable. So unlike our old original Raman system, this kit can be packed up and put on the train works in these two suitcases here, and we can be uh, set up and operating within a half an hour of arriving at an institution. These suitcases contain a Raman spectrometer and or the rest of the gear that we use. Um, FORS has already been mentioned. One of the issues that we have with FORS is that we're shining light onto the page and looking at the scattered light, the reflected light from the surface. And again, commercial systems can be a little bit dangerous here. The system that we're using has two features that I'd like to point out. First of all, the distance, the standoff between the head here and the manuscript is around about five to eight centimeters, depending on the design we're operating at the time. That gives us a massive margin for safety. A huge distance allows us to be operating very safely from the book. It's frame mounted, so it's very stable. The light level on the book is around about 12 and a half hundred lux. So around 1,000, just over 1,000 lux, which is what you'd have as background illumination, typically in a, in a conservation studio. The commercial systems can be two orders of magnitude or more than this. Um, this design employs two light beams. It's what we call our Lancaster design. We have two light beams illuminating the sample. 
and by triangulation, when the two light spots here overlap, that's the optimum position for collection of the sample. And you can see here some examples of spectra of smalt, indigo, and so forth. All blue pigments characterized by the reflection in the blue spectrum of the region, absorption in the red, but look in the near infrared, there are significant differences between these pigments. If we push out into the, oops, into the near infrared, this is the system which we've developed further. Again, we're using very low light levels. So we're down in those non heating, non thermally uh, dangerous light levels. We see no temperature rise of the manuscript, which is really important. And we can push our spectral region out now to 2600 nanometers. Here's an example of a, a spectrum of uh, azurite shown with these characteristics of the rabbit's ears up here around 2200 nanometers. And this is all portable gear. Uh, operating at a distance from the manuscript. The final method I'll talk about is fluorescence spectroscopy, whereby we shine light on an object and we look at the fluorescence, which is typically emitted at longer wavelength. And we can do this either in point measurements, uh, in the imaging, or also in time resolve mode, so we can gain a lot of information about the sample. This particular kit here is our Egyptian blue detector. We shine a red uh, spot of light on the sample and then look at the time course of the light coming out of the sample, which gives us a characteristic. Uh, pattern of fingerprint for Egyptian blue. So let's have a quick look at the blues then that have been used over the ages. We've got uh, the indigo used from the fifth century onwards. Uh, this Egyptian blue, which I've mentioned there, we have the Egyptian blue detector, typically found in the, the, the 10th and now the 13th century. Lapis lazuli appears in the UK around the 10th century. Azurite starts to come in the 13th. And then finally, smalt um, arrives around the 15th century in Britain. And these pigments are being deployed in different ways. Uh, one of the reasons potentially for lapis being replaced by azurite around the 13th century was, well, azurite is much cheaper. It's a cheaper pigment, and there may have been um, difficulties in, in getting hold of lapis in, in, in Britain at that time as well. But lapis was sometimes used for key figures. So for example, the Virgin Mary. And here in some 15th century manuscripts, sorry, 14th, 15th century manuscripts, we see a preferential use of lapis lazuli for the key figures. In this case, uh, the godhead is painted in lapis lazuli, where all the illumination here is in azurite. And this, the Abingdon Missal at Trinity College, Oxford, all of the blues on this page are azurite or indigo, whereas elsewhere in the book, um, lapis is reserved for the Virgin Mary, for God, and also for the patron's crest. So there's a very specific use of lapis. How can we image that very quickly? Well, one way is to use false color imaging, where we're playing games with the image that we present to the, the viewer and changing the components that make up those, um, the, those parts of the image. So for example, we're gonna make the blue component appear blue in the image, the green and red appear green in the image, and the near infrared reflectance from the object appears red. So in this case, um, and Richard will talk in more detail about this book, what happens here is the blue lapis lazuli in our false color image appears magenta, whereas the blue azurite used ironically here in the Virgin Mary appears blue. And this data takes only a matter of seconds to acquire and process. So this gives us a very quick triage to look on the page at what pigments are being used and allows us then to go in with other techniques, fours and Raman spectroscopy and potentially XRF to identify the pigments present. One quick thing I'll mention here, uh, an unusual find this year in a 13th century manuscript, we found all the blue areas can contain mixtures of lapis, azurite, and traces of Egyptian blue. And I want to tell you about this one because it gives a really nice example of why you need to mul use multiple techniques. So Raman spectroscopy <coughs> really only shows lapis lazuli and Egyptian blue. Uh, it also shows that there's no indigo in this book. Uh, um, the, the Raman is very sensitive towards indigo. Fours, pretty much just shows that azurite is present. And fluorescence confirms the presence of low levels of Egyptian blue. And I would argue here that there are standards or gold standard techniques rather for particular pigments. So for example, fours I mentioned is the gold standard I would argue for detecting azurite on the page. Raman is no good for azurite. If you want to detect azurite by Raman spectroscopy, you have to use high powers of typically of green light, and that can cause thermal damage and, and blacken the azurite on the spot you've illuminated. Um, fluorescent spectroscopy is absolutely the method to use for Egyptian blue. So let's have a quick look at our book. Oops. 
Um, here's a picture of the page. You can see some nice powder blue alongside red text and black galatanic ink. The red is vermilion. Uh, the blue, however, well, it appears dark in the infrared, which suggests that it's a copper-based pigment. Uh, if we carry out force measurements, you can see here you've got those characteristic ears of azurite and also a hint that there is a lapis mixture um, in there. If we carry out Raman spectroscopy, you can see the characteristic bands of the um, lapis lazuli in the system. And then if we wiggle to a different position on the sample, we get a massive peak of fluorescence of a long wavelength, which is suggesting that potentially there's Egyptian blue there. And if we reconfigure our spectrometer to look for Egyptian blue, sure enough, we've got a big band at 900 nanometers, which is a characteristic of that. And then we go in and look at fluorescence imaging. And you can see here in our letter, there are sparkles, specks of highly luminescent material, which are specks of Egyptian blue in the sample. So if you looked at this letter just by Raman, you would see lapis. By fours, you would see that there's a lapis azurite mixture. By the fluorescent spectroscopy, uh, you can see there's also Egyptian blue, and that's a rather complicated and interesting find. At that point, I'm going to hand over to Richard, so we're literally going to change chairs. Hello. Mm. Well, thanks to this technology, we have identified the blue colorants in over 300 British medieval books from the 7th to the 15th century. To convey some sense of both the breadth and the depth of our findings, I'm going to sketch broad patterns of use over this long period as a whole, and then look in more detail at the deployment of the two mineral blues in the 15th century. Up to the 9th century, as you've just heard, the sole blue colorant was indigo seen here in one of our Durham manuscripts, Woad. The range expanded dramatically during the 10th century with the arrival of lapis lazuli, Egyptian blue and azurite. Henceforth, indigo was generally reserved for darkening other colours or for creating blacks and purples. Egyptian blue was employed as a pigment in its own right during the second quarter of the 10th century, but thereafter features only as an adulterant of lapis being used thus up to 1100 and then again, as you've just heard, in the mid 13th century. Azurite, though deployed at Winchester in the late 10th century, then enjoyed little currency there or anywhere else for the following 200 years in Britain, during which lapis was the standard all-purpose blue. Supplies of this semi-precious mineral from Afghanistan were evidently abundant and of high quality at that point. This is a 13th century manuscript painted by William de Braille. Mixtures of lapis and azurite occasionally appear in the later 12th century. In the early 13th, azurite was sometimes employed in place of lapis. And by the second quarter of that century, the example here, a slow but sure transition away from lapis in favor of azurite begun. In the 14th century, while the choice of one as opposed to the other might be determined by aesthetic considerations, the precise hue for a particular context, there's evidence that status and hierarchy of the project as a whole, of the subject being painted, governed which of these two mineral blues was deployed. A watershed in the availability and use of lapis occurred in the middle of the 15th century. Thereafter, it appears only in negligible quantities as an additive to certain zones of azurite. An alternative material that was occasionally employed by this state was smalt. Indigo, when used as a blue rather than a darkening agent, now tended to be reserved for thin lines and fine details, small elements requiring careful pen control for which an easy flowing dye was better suited than a granular pigment. So that's the overview. Let's now consider in more detail the deployment of lapis lazuli and azurite during the 15th century. During the first half of that century, they were both in regular use. In the second half, azurite alone appears. If lapis is there, it is in tiny amounts added to small areas of azurite. So from the 1450s, the quantity of lapis used by English illuminators is negligible. Taking the long view, this is the final stage of a steady decline in lapis usage from the high point of the 12th century. The retrenchment in question, doubtless related in part to its rising price, something documented in Italian sources. Yet since the quantities needed to illuminate a book as opposed to paint a panel were very small, this is unlikely to be the whole story. 
And since the cessation in Britain happens at a specific time, it's natural to wonder whether particular circumstances in the mid 15th century acted as a catalyst. Factors that might help account for the phenomenon are a reorientation of English patronage, the expulsion of England from France in the last phase of the Hundred Years' War, the 1450s, and the fall of Constantinople to the Turks, 1453. The second and third of these could have disrupted the supply chain for something that came all the way from Afghanistan. The trend for English patrons to look to continental booksellers to supply their needs had been accelerated by the occupation of France during the first half of the 15th century and peaked in the second half. A correlative of greater expenditure on foreign books was reduced investment at the upper end of the native industry, the part most likely to use lapis lazuli. Without tracking the quantity of lapis deployed in the books of other European countries across the 15th century, it's impossible to know whether the 1450s were a turning point in its use for illumination more generally, and hence whether national or international factors were primarily responsible for what we see in the English sample. Nevertheless, the greater continu continuity in lapis use in Italian illumination from the mid to late 15th century and its lavish presence in some French volumes of the late 15th century suggests that conditions specific to England, an interruption in the supply of luxury goods traditionally acquired in or via France, redirected patronage or both, contributed to making the 1450s a watershed in lapis usage here. This is the Bolton Hours from York. Within the broad trend of decline then cessation in lapis use during the 15th century, there are other factors that influence the ways the mineral blues were deployed. It's surely no coincidence that most of the early 15th century volumes that feature no lapis whatsoever come from provincial centres, Norwich, York and so on. The precise reasons for its absence from these manuscripts are unknowable, and any or all of availability, cost, artistic presence could have been involved but that location has some bearing on the phenomenon, seems likely. Oops. Hang on, there we go. A second factor is aesthetic. In certain books, lapis and azurite were deployed in tandem to achieve complementary effects. In this image from the early 15th century, the rich blue border scrolls are lapis with a modicum of azurite. The lighter blue robes are a more evenly calibrated mix of the two while the darker robes are as you write alone. It was the wish for different hues that determined how exactly the artist employed the two pigments. This picture, done in 1477, provides a complementary case with, concordant with its later date, greater reliance upon azurite. The blue of the border is a high-grade azurite alone, while the greyer blues used for the ceiling and for robes were achieved by mixing low-grade lapis into the azurite. A third factor is the participation of different hands. In the Old Gate Cartulary, a manuscript now in Glasgow, of 1425 to 7, the blue decorated initials in the stint of the first artist are lapis, while those in the stint of the second are predominantly azurite. The precise reasons behind such contrasts, scriptorium hierarchies, personal taste, access to different supplies, even changed priorities, are irrecoverable. But that the use of lapis might sometimes be restricted to or favoured by certain members of a team is clear. A fourth issue is hierarchy of materials and subject matter. The more important the feature, the more lapis it would contain. All the blue in the decoration of this Wycliffeite Bible is lapis lazuli alone, while all that used for the text initials and paraphs is azurite. The usage in this missal from the first half of the 15th century is similar, but more opulent. The blue in the art is lapis alone. That used for the text initials is a lapis azurite mix. Even in the second half of the 15th century, when lapis was no longer used as an independent pigment, such practices continued. The basic blue in this late 15th century Psalter is azurite, but lapis azurite mixtures were used for David's row and with a higher percentage of lapis for God's aureole. And you can see those brought out in this false color image, the purple pink highlighting the lapis elements. As the lapis enriched blues here are not especially beautiful. This was hardly undertaken for aesthetic reasons and was surely therefore done for symbolic ones. Mm. 
There are also cases the reverse, counter hierarchical deployment of azurite and lapis. In the Bobbingworth Psalter, a rich lapis blue was employed for text capitals and blue script, while a teal colored azurite was used in the decoration. This could reflect contrasting preferences or resources, or even the level expenditure authorized for the different participants. The two scribes on the one hand, the illuminator on the other. On the first decorated page of the Hours of Richard III, the borders were painted with lapis, the robes of Mary in azurite, and there that's highlighted by the false color image. We can be certain this was not done to prior to prior prioritize the borders over the Mother of God. And elsewhere in the book, the normal order resumes with azurite for the borders, lapis for the figures. The departure on this first page presumably reflects aesthetic criteria, the wish for Mary's robe to be visually distinct from the border, possibly allied to some happenstance, such as confusion of paint pots, using azurite where lapis was intended, or poor coordination between different workers, one hand lavishing lapis on the border, meaning that to have a tonal contrast, the other had to resort to azurite. While some such cases are inscrutable, others admit a simple explanation. When the available pigments were a good quality azurite, but a mediocre lapis, and they were deployed according to hue, the former would logically be given precedence over the latter. In this early 15th century manual, the basic blue was a fine azurite that yielded a rich color. Indigo and lapis were added to it to get darker and lighter tones respectively. So the dark blue robes of the Virgin, the most important subject, are azurite alone or azurite and indigo. While the elements to which a lapis was added, foliate forms and letter parts, are of a lesser significance. A final factor was the more random one of what was to hand at a given time. The blue used for texts and capitals at the start of this Psalter was azurite with a little lapis. It rapidly resolved to azurite alone. It's unlikely this change was engineered for particular visual effect, nor given that the quantity of lapis involved was tiny, would it represent an economy. Probably therefore, it was simply a side effect of using up one particular black batch of blue that happened to include a little lapis and moving on to another that did not. Correspondingly, all the blues in this late 15th century statue to Anglia are wholly or largely azurite. For variation in tone, it was mixed with carbon or lead white. In two places, however, the headdress of the centaur you've got down here on the left and a patch of sky on another page, a minute quantity of lapis was added to the azurite. In a single detail, the prongs that the centaur is holding in his arrow was rendered in lapis alone. These are such small inconsequential parts of the artwork and the hues in question so unremarkable. It's impossible to believe that lapis was deliberately selected on account of any intrinsic value or artistic effect. Rather, the illuminator was simply using up, surely, the residue of an alternative blue that happened to be to hand. An opulent book of ours dating from the second quarter of the 15th century, wherein the juxtapositions and intertwinings of lapis and azurite are particularly complex, demonstrates how several of the factors I've considered separately might operate simultaneously. Sometimes the pigments are de deployed hierarchically, other times counter hierarchically. The two minerals are often allied to particular classes of decoration and perhaps therefore to specific hands. The blue in the borders was generally azurite unless a figural motif was included whereupon lapis was used instead. Yet whatever the disposition and relative quantities of the two minerals on a given page, the aesthetic effect here is always spectacular, which was surely the key point. This brings us finally to the crucial question of whether a 15th century purchaser would have been able to distinguish lapis from azurite. Contracts sometimes mandated the quality of blue, but rarely specified in England at least the mineral. Thus an indenture from the York Chapter Acts for a Psalter instructed that the verse initials were to be done in a good azure, a good vermilion as well. Artists could test their supplies by fire to distinguish between powdered azurite and powdered lapis, for when heated, the former will discolor, but the latter will not. Plainly, however, burning was not a good option for the owner of a finished book, 
whose primary concern appears to have been that the pigment be attractive in colour rather than it derive from one mineral as opposed to the other. You have the false colour image of the same page, purple, lapis, blue, azurite. In fact, we today, thanks to the technologies you've heard about, are the very first people to know what was really used in these books since they left the hands of their illuminators. And consequently, we are the first to be able to address the sorts of questions I've treated today. If you want to know more, obviously buy our book on British Illuminators Pigments when it comes out, or even better, invite us to look at your own manuscripts. The future for pigment research is bright. Thank you. He, Richard, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I, I know I've got lots of questions. It's probably worth saying uh, before we get into them that the uh, this talk and the whole conference indeed uh, pre-pandemic was originally going to be in, in Glasgow. And we've enjoyed having uh, Andy and <coughs> Richard up in Glasgow <coughs> looking at our looking at the blues in our manuscripts already. So if you do get that opportunity to invite them to your institution, please do. Um, now, questions again, uh, it's exactly the same as before. If you could either put those into the chat or if you want to raise your hand using the raise hand icon and I'll come and visit you and you can, you can speak your question out. I've got, I've got one to, to kick us off in that case. Um, so many of the conclusions that you were drawing there about the blue, the, 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 the theses that, that you have, um, presumably can only come once you've actually analysed, uh, once, you, once you've looked, once you've gone through the process and actually analysed these things. So in a way, I suppose, in terms of process, that's a reversal from a usual approach where you, you come up with a, a thesis that you're then testing. So what I'm wondering, I suppose, is, is there value simply in just taking a look at a manuscript and seeing what research questions come up? Is that, is that the approach that you, you'd recommend? Um, to start with, with our project, I, I was aware of groups of books that for various reasons, historically, art, historically, culturally, looked likely to be interesting, and sometimes they proved interesting, other times not. The second point to make is that much previous research, such, such as was done, focused on the star manuscripts. What we've tried to do always is balance the ordinary books with the star manuscripts. So for instance, just talking about lapis lazuli, how can you be confident that it was widely used in illumination, say in England in the 12th century? Well, if it's being used at Lantony Prima in Monmouthshire, one of the most remote parts of you know, the British Isles, that's more helpful than being able to say, oh, well, it was used in the Winchester Bible. So every book will tell us something, in relation to what we, all, we know already, and with 300 books under our belt, we're in a position now to contextualise the information we get from any individual book. But we did start with research questions from which I drew up lists of manuscripts that seemed likely to help us answer those, and sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Yeah, I, I guess the other thing to, to answer that question is that, uh, as, as Richard, uh, Richard quite often says, you, know, you can't tell a pigment by its colour, and I think the, the, although you may, when you look at a manuscript, you may have a hypothesis about what it is, it's a bit of a, a, a really a lottery as to what is actually on the page. So you have to do these spectroscopic measurements, you have to make the scientific measurements to unequivocally and forensically identify the materials. You simply cannot tell just by looking. Um, I mean, that, that example of the 13th century book, is a, it was a real eye-opener. Um, you'd never have guessed to see that combination, in fact, you know, short of seeing indigo and smalt in there, would have had the full set. It would have been a you know, full house. So you do have to do the measurements, but the measurements are very straightforward now. You know, the, the equipment is is very easy to use and, and very mobile. So there's no excuse for guessing. So you really should, by all means, have a hypothesis, but you really have to test it before you write the book. That's great. Thank you. I've got a, a question here from Elizabeth Henderson, um, uh, who is asking, saying, I'm interested in whether you're thinking of comparing your results on manuscripts of the later 15th century with pan decoration in Incunabula. Um, we haven't on the whole been looking at Incunabula, but we have occasionally. So for instance, we've looked at um, the volume of the Gutenberg Bible that's in Lambeth Palace. 
um, a Gutenberg Bible, a great treasure today, I can tell you that no expense was expended on the decoration added to it in England, that it was like the illumination there is with the cheapest possible colors. In a nutshell, in relation, those in, in Cunabula that we've looked at are using exactly the same palette and on the whole, the lower end of it than what you find in contemporary illumination. Yeah. So um, Jenny has asked about the latest use of woad. Um, what, one thing to point out here is that the blue pigment is indigo. This is the molecule that gives it the blue color. Now, identifying whether the um, indigo has come from the woad plant or from the um, Indian indigo plant it is impossible. Chemically, it's impossible because it's the molecule that we're seeing. And so identifying whether it's woad as the pigment or, or, or the indigo uh, from, from imported indigo is, is not possible with our techniques. Uh, you'd have to be looking at other trace materials in there. We really haven't thought about how you would do that. But of course, the woad plant grows like a weed. You know, in fact, I started it growing in my neighbor's garden and it, it is now taken over. It's a very easy plant to get hold of in, in Britain and, and Europe. Yeah. We've got a few more questions are flying yeah, in. And, and Anna's, <laughs> Anna's question about the, I mean, yeah, excellent question. This is in fact the question that's really driven our project. And, and this question regarding, you know, the, the use of the precious and less precious pigments and why, why they're appearing in the manuscripts. Well, we can only really begin to address that question now because we can identify the pigments and we know that when we look at a pigment and we get uh, some data from the spectroscopy, what the pigment is. Um, so now we have that kind of information, we can start to address exactly that question to address how societal values are being presented in the manuscripts that we see. And I mean, we tend to think that purple is a luxury colour and that's its resonance, purple books, super expensive. But generally purple is one of the cheapest colors. So there's a case where its symbolism, its symbolic value is not the same as its real, its real world value. And equally, the point that part of my talk was about, or our talk was about, that actually lapis use really vanishes from England in the middle of the 15th century, very dramatically. There must be broader cultural phenomena that help us explain that. But until we had looked at 60 plus manuscripts in the 15th century, this was a completely unknown phenomenon. So we are by this work discovering things about trade patterns and use patterns that, that we now have to think about, which haven't been thought about before. Um, Daryl's asked about other, other spectra we find that we don't know what they are yet sometimes, and we pursue those like, uh, like, like terriers. So yes, we have some in our pile that need addressing. Um, and where but time's I mean, ticking. The point, the point there also is if we can then guess what certain blues or greens might be, we can buy the minerals and, give, and test them to get reference spectra, and sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not lucky. Um, the question about uh, the Afghan lapis, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, one of the joys of this project, I do a lot of outreach, act or always have done outreach activities as a chemist, and the, the, the manuscripts work is an absolutely fantastic platform to take to people because you can explain the intricacies of spectroscopy using something that people are interested in. And, and so it's really people get the, the, the science. And for sure, I mean, actually, I have yeah. my, my, uh, my, my His doorstop here. is this, about to appear. This is actually my doorstop. I don't know if you can see this. This is a piece of lapis from, from Afghanistan, which was imported a few years ago now. And, and I reckon um in in the, the value of this would have been such that uh, in the uh, the middle ages this would have been worth its weight in gold around about 120,000 pounds I, I didn't pay that i hasten to add for this piece of <laughs> it's a beautiful shows the bedding place beautifully um the sarah's asked a question can, about can i just can i suggest we just we read, we read the questions out just so that uh, for the sorry, video yes, people not seeing the questions we don't have access to the yeah. chat simultaneously oh. Um, so we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, is it Sarah Charles one here? Yes. So when has Massigo been found? Was it used deliberately as a pigment or is it just red, red lead that hasn't been cooked properly? The answer to that is again impossible to tell. Um, the preparation of red lead involves heating white lead uh, in the presence of oxygen, the presence of air. And if you overheat it or you don't let enough air in, then you get Massico produced. Now you have to bear in mind that the chemists of old, the people preparing these pigments, weren't preparing the pigment with a 
view to making a chemically pure substance, they were getting a pigment that suited their eye, that matched the colour they wanted. And sometimes we do see effectively pure Massico being used, and it has a slightly different colour to the, um, the minium, to the traditional red lead orange. And so we can only assume that they, they were um, aiming for that colour at that point. Just, um, just to gloss that, that's more common in the later Middle Ages. So occasionally in the 12th century, you'll see different versions of orange, some more massico rich than others, others more minium. And they're used in such a way, it's almost certain the artist wants those different colours. And you see that again in the 15th century. In the early Middle Ages, in the early insular manuscripts, they, on the whole, seem to go for blocks of one colour. And so where we're finding massico there, it's more certainly an unfortunate side effect. That's great. There's a, a, a question here from Beth. Oh, it's disappeared again. <laughs> the chat. Beth moved. coming. Um, would yeah. it be possible to di discriminate between different scriptoria of the same period based on the general palette of pigment used within them? Well, what a good question. And the answer is sometimes yes and often no. Now, there are many reasons why I often no, not least the fact that illuminators move even in when we're thinking of the monastic era, some of the great illuminations were almost certainly supplied by itinerant professionals. If we just, for instance, take the case of the Winchester Bible, you can look at the six or however many artists we think contributed to it, and some of them have quite distinct palettes with different choices of pigment. So there's a case where the pigment is artist specific. If we then look at places like Canterbury in the 10th to 11th century, where we can be relatively confident that 90%, perhaps more of the work is being done in house by a group of people who find the same pigments used over and over again. So it does depend from place to place, but when you've got a larger database and we've got a reasonable cross-section of 12th century material, for instance, we do find certain things, certain choices, and certain materials are more characteristic of certain places than others. And Albans, for instance, like a particular purple that we don't find elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, what one mention, uh, Bob, just to, if I may, a question um, asked about, um, or, or it was a, a response by Helen uh, News at the BL about the Afghan families settling in Camden. Um, I would like some lapis. I think since the um, uh, the British Museum are uh, local as well, so they might be a, a centre that you could look to for samples of lapis. Although I, I was rather um, distressed to find recently with the changes, the political upheaval in Afghanistan, lapis is set to become a, a, a essentially a source of funding for perhaps unacceptable activities in that region now. So I think the um, it, it's going to become a, a politicised material. So I think that's quite a sad reflection on on world politics. I think we're on, almost out of time. Thanks for, for all the questions. I've, I've got one more, uh, if, if I may. Um, you mentioned at the end that the that if anyone's interested, they should invite you to their, their library. Are you only currently interested in manuscripts um, with British illuminators and or and or uh, if you live outside of the UK? Uh, is it possible for you to, to visit them uh, as people look at their libraries? We're interested in all manuscripts and have published on French and Flemish and Italian, as well as on British books. We were just talking to our particular project and we are in the advanced, you know, the final stages of finishing our account of British illuminators. So that was the focus here. And yes, we are, we are um, prepared to travel virtually anywhere, safe zones, so long as it's, you know, COVID approved and so on. So we have we have worked outside the British Isles and, are, and we'll be happy to do so in due course. That's brilliant. Well, look, thank you both very, very much for what was a fascinating talk. Uh, and also thank you to Dr. Paola Ricciardi and Dr. Laura Angelova for their talk earlier. Uh, that's bringing us to the end of our first session of uh, the day. Uh, we've now got a lunch break from 12.05 to 1.05. And we'll be back after lunch with some talks by Catherine Rudy and Aileen Tistel, uh, and also by Matthew Collins. Um, so, but don't forget to take your sandwiches along to see Laura um, in, in our community area uh, and have a chat and ask her any questions, burning questions you've got about your own collections, uh, ask with some expert advice. Okay, thank you very much everyone and we'll see you after lunch. <laughs>